Where did we go wrong? We were cool hairstylists that rocked at doing hair. And we thought, I'm gonna open a business and I'm gonna do it better than my owner and I'm gonna treat people better and I'm gonna pay people better. And then we took two to five people, started our business and offered them a higher pay. The next group did the same thing and then the next group did the same thing. And now the expectation wow. of what yeah. people could get got higher and then it became a standard. Yeah. And now that it's a standard, everybody is terrified to pay lower because they think that the people will leave to somewhere else. If we're not talking about the past and not trying to better the present to make a better future, we're all just going to be continuously running in that in that hamster wheel. Do you have a forecast as to where things are going to be? You know, everybody right now is rethinking their whole life. I think it's going to force owners to operate like business people. You know, there's no more faking it, um, just having a busy looking, sexy looking salon. I've been in the industry for a very long time. Um, I started skipping high school to go wash hair at the salon, so that gives you an idea of where I started. And uh, I spent the first decade working with clients, so doing hair behind the chair. And then I wanted to progress to owning a salon. And so then I transitioned to working with teams. And um, now I'm really passionate about working with salon owners. So kind of going into the third decade, uh, shifting into working with owners. What was your first salon uh, makeover like? Uh, as a coach? Yeah. Nobody was really doing the financial side. So I thought, okay, I'm going to start with the financial side because I really love it. And um, I think it really helps people. And my first client, when we did her cash flow projections, she was on track to lose $50,000 that year. Wow. And by going in and tweaking the plan, um, you know, little changes in every area, uh, she ended up being up 20 by the end of the year. So it was a $70,000 swing. And uh, yeah, and that's just, you know, what I'm passionate about is seeing results. And that's what I love about numbers is they don't lie to you. And you can see, you know, a tangible uh, payback. There's a lot of coaching type of uh, systems out there. Do you make it more simple for salon owners? Is it do you have a, a more simplified system? Are you more engaged with them? I have a process that I use um, that really works. And I have an online course. Um, and so what I was finding is it's really fun. I teach live courses too. And they're, you know, they're, that's how I met Franco. Oh, that's right. I was just going to say <laughs> and, that's how Right. Met. And we had so much fun that day, yeah. right? I still totally. remember we had, we had a great day and um, it's fun, but then they go home and I go home and it's over. And so with the coaching, it's that ongoing relationship. And it's also um, with the online resources, you can go in and rewatch it. So if there's a concept that didn't quite sink in, that you need to hear it again, you can go over and over and over at your own pace. So I really love um, the tools that I can give people to support them um, because it's an ongoing relationship rather than just a one-time weekend thing that you have to try to figure out what to do with all the information after. I came into this business course that you were offering through, I think it was L'Oreal at the time, right? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. And and I was one of the only chair rental salons, of course, in your class. You know, at first I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I should message her because, you know, I paid for this class. But then I messaged you and it was 10 minutes later, you're like, oh my God, do you want to just talk on the phone? And I'm like, <laughs> what? Is this actually happening right now? I have somebody that's a, not only a coach, but like a mentor and a friend. And we aren't the smartest with numbers. We're more creative. And it's really nice to have people like yourself that are willing to step back from the chair and actually step into a different role and actually engage in that way. I was one of those people that, you know, when we were talking about my numbers and my situation with my business, it was like, I thought I was X number and it was a Y number. And I was like, whoa, I got to readjust everything that I've been doing because I think a lot of chair rental salon owners think we know the numbers. And then once we open and we get those three, four, six, nine months down the road, we realize, oh, maybe my numbers weren't right. Because, you know, we're thinking of the rent or the how much we spend in the beginning months, but we don't think about how much we spent at the end of the year divided that. So it was a really excellent experience for me. And that's why I was excited to bring you and join us on the hair fellas because I think it is going to teach a lot of people about not only who you are but what you can offer and and what you've offered me already in in my nine eight years of business. Uh, I love that you said that, Franco. And the funny thing about it is that was me too, right? Like I skipped high school. I'm you know I'm not a math whiz in any sense, and I that's what I keep trying to tell people, salon owners, is you don't have to do math. Like we have spreadsheets for that. We have calculators yeah. for that. <laughs> 
Like this is not math we're talking about. And this is actually the artistic side of numbers because we're actually bringing the numbers to life to tell you a story about your business. And then it does, it's kind of like investigative work where you're like, oh, why is that number high? I'm going to figure it out. Um, and so if, for me, my whole thing is like falling in love with your numbers. Like, let's not make it this really painful thing. Um, let's make it more this challenge of like, uh, figuring out what's going on in your business and a little bit of detective work. So that's, I'm so glad that it helped you, Franco. And I'm so glad that we've continued the relationship. And that's what the coaching is all about is continuing that initial relationship. And um, I, I love what you said about, you know, bringing the salon vibe to the numbers, because that's exactly, um, you know, I was always so passionate about my clients, my team, and I'm the same about my salon owners. I just want to see them succeed and, you know, push them up and help them to skip the painful mistakes that I made. Right. Like I already did it. You don't need to do it too. <laughs> well, when, if maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it took you several years to actually realize your mistakes. Like, right. If I, it was like several years. Right. And you're like, what's going on? And it almost kind of like it punched you in the face. It wasn't like oh, something. Oh, it punched me in the face. <laughs> yeah, right? like, I remember. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was like everybody else working, busting behind the chair, right? Six days a week behind the chair doing my own clients. I was having a blast and there was lots of money coming in. And so I thought my business was doing well. I thought cash in the bank uh, equaled a, a successful business. And uh, what I didn't know, which is what I got punched in the face with, was when I got pregnant and had my first daughter and decided to go to France because I'm like, oh, my business is great. It's so <laughs> awesome. Um, and my first payroll while I was in France bounced. And no. that was that was the punch in the face because I was like, what the heck? So you were I because you were, you were looking at I your was numbers. The payroll. I was the payroll. And I keep telling people like you're paying people to work for you. And they're like, yeah, of course, like if you want someone to work for you, you have to pay them. But no, like you're literally like paying them with your paycheck. <laughs> like that's what's happening, right? It's because if you take you out of your business and the payroll bounces, it means that the money you were earning for yourself is actually going into their paycheck too. And so what's kind of funny is some of my salons right now with this COVID-19 that are closed and are able to keep a great retail business, um, you know, some of them might end up making more money. Well, no overhead of, of staff, right? <laughs> because they're not overpaying staff and sucking them dry, you know, with that overpayment. So it's gonna be really interesting to see because some of them already were quite close to um, their break even just with a couple weeks of retail. You know, a lot of the big commission salons and, and the people that have fully booked stylists and stuff, I feel like sometimes the support staff for those busy, busy stylists actually makes it cost more than a junior stylist because, you know, one success, successful stylist that is fully booked is utilizing two, three, four support staff throughout the whole week. And who's paying that support staff? It's it's the business owner, the salon owner. So yeah. the money that they're saving is literally both ends of the spectrum of, of paying the stylist, but also having that support staff to support that stylist. Um, and it's really funny because I think restaurants and hairdress and hair salons are really finding that the overhead is what really is costing them. And I think a lot of restaurants are gonna come out of this looking at the same thing, being like, okay, I didn't have any of my servers. I only had my cooks. The servers make all the money and the cooks are the ones that work the hardest. And now they're realizing, hey, maybe there's a shift. So I think a lot of industries with COVID is going to they're we're all going to have to really analyze the situation today. Yeah, well, and this is for me really exciting times in our industry. And I know it sounds weird to say that, um, but it's giving everyone a chance to reset their business and it's yes. giving them a chance to rethink their business. And now they can come back stronger and they can come back with a business plan that works, right? And, you know, it's not, I could have kept doing what I was doing for 10 years because I was too scared to change and I would have been in the same boat. Um, and so, you know, it takes courage to change. Um, and this is giving everybody a great opportunity because change brings on more change and people are expecting change. So I think this is a great opportunity for everyone to rethink their business and decide, you know, what changes am I going to make? And it really, to me, starts with your numbers because that's where you've got these like red flags blinking at you um, saying like, I need your attention <laughs> right here. Um, and you can see where you actually need the changes. What do you think salons need to be doing right now? Two things that they need to be focused on, and that is... Um, their relationships and their cash flow. Now's the time to really foster your relationships with your team, with your clients, with your community, with neighboring businesses. You know, this, like, I remember when I was, when I owned Hype, we were always like, oh, we need to like 
you know, go talk to that yoga studio or we need to do this. And, you know, it always felt like, you know, you'd make that first contact, but then who was going to pick up the pieces to keep the relationship going? Cause everyone was so right. busy. Um, so, you know, now's the time that you can start making some of these strategic um, alliances in your community for when you do reopen. Um, and then the second is cash flow. And um, actually, because we're here at my, you know, this is off grid property, we have to collect water from the rain. Oh. When we, yeah. And so when we first bought the property, it was already past the rainy season, believe it or not, in Vancouver, we do have a like lull in a rainy season. <laughs> yeah. And so we had no water, right? And so we had to decide, um, we had to last here all summer with like not very much water. And so what did we do? We assessed how much water we had first. And then we did a water budget. We found out like, how much does it take to have a shower? How much does it take to wash the dishes? I love it. Wow. Yeah, and, <laughs> and then we were like, okay, so this is how much we have. If we were to continue living normally, like normal water usage, we would last a month. But we reduced, you know, instead it was like the quick get wet, <laughs> shut the water off, soap up, <laughs> you know, some little changes that we did to make us last. We lasted the entire summer. We still had water to spare. I and, do that with ice cream. That that you know, have to make sure the week. You ration out your ice cream. <laughs> I love it. Um, so that's what salons need to do with their cash right now. Is they need to first and foremost, they need to know where they are exactly. They need to have um, one area where they have all of their expenses, all of their debts, all of the payments that are coming out, um, and then they need to start looking ahead. Now, if my husband and I didn't do that, and we didn't even think about it, a month later we would have been like crap we have nowhere to live and we have no water like how do you live without water it's yeah. Yeah. like it's not that cool right no. and so and you know and that's where salons are at with their cash like if you don't look at it then you can't do anything to change it and so if you do look at it then you can make all these little tiny changes that don't change your life that much um but can make you sustain way longer and so right now we need to just try to sustain as long as we can because we if we had a date we could figure out exactly the numbers yeah. um but we don't have a date so we just have to go lean we have to go lean right and yeah. it's like getting the five last five pounds at the gym <laughs> right it's like when you're working off the you know the beginning part of the weight it kind of sheds off and then you're gonna get stuck and it's the same thing with your finances now is yeah you've asked your landlord to cut your rent yeah you've asked a few things but now go through it again go through it again go through it again and try to go lean and we need to shed every little pound that is not um essential right now and so yeah. we're conserving that cash flow as long as possible until we open up again. Do you have a forecast as to where things are going to be here in the lower mainland when this thing is all over? I think it's going to shift. Um, I think, you know, everybody right now is rethinking their whole life. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there it's inevitable that it's going to shift. But I think it's going to be positive shifts because I think it's going to force owners to operate like business people. And um, that's going to be positive for our industry. So there's yeah. no more, you know, there's no more faking it. Um, just having a busy looking, sexy looking salon from the outside with five support apprentices to one stylist. Um, no, like you, they're going to have to take a hard look at it, um, which is going to force us to evolve into a better business model. And that's really cool. Like that's just you know, my career path was like going like this. Like I started out as an apprentice, stylist, a teacher, a international platform artist, educator, salon owner. <laughs> You've done everything. I love it. But, but like, it was like this uphill, it was like this uphill <laughs> career path. And then like salon owner, it like tanked, right? It was like the lowest point of my life. It was the hardest point of my life. Um, and I was like, it, it's not supposed to be like this. Like, it's supposed to keep going up. <laughs> and I find it interesting how, you know, the hair world, the hair industry has been around for thousands of years, let's say. But as a business, let's call it 100 years. Um, and I feel like, you know, we're constantly telling our clients always, like, you have to change your look. You have to change your appearance. We have to, you know, uh, we're always looking for them to recreate themselves. But when you look at our past as an industry, we haven't recreated our own selves or our industry and the way we pay and the way our businesses are structured in over a hundred years. Like I think the, the biggest drastic change was maybe at the Sassuni age of when we started departmentalizing the industry and then that started creating the experience of a salon brand that people started coming in to the salon. And I feel like right now we're really seeing how many people go to stylists in salons and style or clients that go to salons for stylists. So we're finding I'm finding that it's becoming a little bit more 
like you're, like you said, we're having to, we're being forced to recreate the way we operate for business because what we've been doing in the past is proven not to help or be like not profitable for all of us. Like even yeah. the, like, you know, you look at the, the percentage of, of the salons that are actually profitable and how much their profitability is. It's like you, you end up looking back and think like, is this even worth it? Like, is this shit worth it? Like how often we have to go in on, you know, that the 10 to 13, 14, 15 hour days and then go home and still do work. You end up looking at it and being like, is it worth it? But then, you know, who we are, we're such, you know, people like pleasers that we always make it worth it because of who we are. And it, it's, it's interesting to see how something like this is going to force us to make big changes. Yeah. Um, and, and I love that you said that it's going to readjust, you know, and, and just showcase or show who's actually prepared and who's done the due diligence of, of being prepared for this. And even if it's not even like mentally prepared, but it's like structurally prepared to make changes quickly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and one of, one of the things that we have to think about, too, is um, we say go back 100 years, like just go back uh, 30 years. Yeah. We didn't pay for. Like when I started, I was writing my appointments in a paper book, right? True. And so we've added all these additional expenses to our business without adjusting the model. Yeah. And so maybe our business even worked 50 years ago with the 50-50 model, um, but we never adapted to now we pay for websites. Now we pay for social media people. Now we pay for um, the latest software instead of a $20 paper book. And where and now we have a lot more support staff than we used to have because the experience is so important. And where did all that money come from? Our rents are higher. You know, all the expenses went up and we never changed the model. So you've yeah. got it like dead on there of, yeah, it's time for a change. This is kind of the reset that you were you were referring to. This is going to be something for everybody to clean house, reevaluate everything and uh, possibly look at uh, starting a whole new business model with what you were referring to. So it's kind of exciting yeah. in a way. It is exciting. Yeah. I know for me, like personally, I'm, I'm reevaluating my situation, in my shop because of the situation is like, it does expose your weakness for sure. And, you know, I have a different situation than most salon owners. And, you know, even though a lot of times I think, oh, maybe I'm ahead, but there's no, no such thing as being ahead right now. Like no. realistically, nobody's ahead. We're all on the same equal playing field. And it's the first time in my career that all salons are on the same equal playing field. And mm -hmm. And it's bringing us closer together because we're all experiencing the same thing. And I feel like this is literally going to see something evolve out of this that it's going to be difficult for a majority of the stylists and salon owners because most of us don't like to see uncontrolled change. We like to see gradual change in our business, but then we want to see our clients extreme changes and extreme makeovers. So we're finally having to readjust everything. Yeah, I love that analogy, Franco. That's awesome because it's true. Like we're like, oh, do something different. Like we're like, oh, it's so boring. They just want to trim every time. But yeah, when you look at your business that way, like what are you willing to change? We're and only willing I, to trim the fat. Like the first thing we look at budget, it's like, okay, let's maybe cheapen the coffee or let's get rid of some <laughs> of the magazines. And it's like, what is that going to do to your business? Like, yeah. What are some common areas in a salon uh, business that you have come across where people fell short? Was it yeah. overusing oh, color? You asked. Was it? It's, yeah. There's three main areas. So there's your payroll to your stylus. Um, and sorry, stylus, if you're listening here, I, I, it's not like I'm not against you and I'm not against your like, it's not about your owner cutting your pay. What I want is a win win for everyone. Right yeah. now, you've got a big piece of a small pie yeah. and it's just not sustainable. And so we need to get you a smaller piece of a bigger pie. So we need to teach the owners to grow the pie <laughs> and slice it up a little more evenly. And then you still get to eat as much pie, right, at the end of the day. And so that's what it's all about. Um, you know, I'm not here just like against stylists, but um, I don't know another industry uh, that payroll is so high. Like yeah. there's just, it's it doesn't exist in any really? other industry. Not even in like the skincare industry, like not even in the um, aesthetic studios. When I went to my personal trainer, and I was like, oh, I pay like what, 100 bucks for the workout, 120 maybe. He went to school for six years to become a kinesiologist. And I said, how much do you keep out of that 120? And he said, $28. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. And so this wow. is like that. Cool. And that's the portion of kind of where payroll should sit, right? Like, let's say it was 100 bucks. You know, the payroll should sit like between 30, 40%. Uh, we're trying to push it to 40, but, you know, everybody's freaking out. Um, but when you think about, you know, your um, rent is going to be like six to 10 percent, your 
um, product costs is, you know, six to ten percent. Your overhead is thirty percent. You know, like. Uh, Do you really you're think that most uh, salon owners actually have a ten percent uh, rent right now in Vancouver? Uh, Va Vancouver. I mean, some of, some of them have twenty. Some of them are paying twenty percent rent because yeah, their sales aren't right. high I, enough. Yeah. yeah. So now you add a sixty percent commission and a twenty percent rent. <laughs> yeah. You know. And the average is 28% overheads, so that's where you're taking the money right out of your own pocket and putting it back into your business. To Number one is the payroll. Number two is the support staff, right? So that's just having, like, we ran a $1.1 million company with nine chairs, um, one, res one full-time receptionist, one part-time receptionist, and one apprentice. And wow. so, and I see companies that are doing like 600,000 in sales. They have double the square footage we have. They have like triple the support staff and you know, yeah. it just, doesn't, it doesn't crunch out. And for a, t for a while there, I wanted to bring on an operating partner and I have all these like fun spreadsheets. That's what I offer in my course. They're really like easy to use. And I sat down with this potential partner and we crunched the numbers up every way we could. And we just couldn't find enough money in the business to make it worth it. Like you were saying, Franco, is it worth it, right? Yeah. Like we could not like make it worth two of us being in that business. Um, so, you know, that's where the numbers come in handy because you can see, that's where you can see, is it worth it? Because uh, it's so funny, sometimes uh, the owners that I work with are not paying themselves. So they're working on the front desk, they're not paying themselves. And I, I hear say, that a okay, lot. Yes. Yeah. And I say, okay, when you work on the front desk, pay yourself as your front desk person, like 15, 20 bucks an hour. And they're like, I'm worth more than that. <laughs> so you're not paying yourself more than that. With everything that everything yeah. that gets calculated, you've got a spreadsheet and uh, everything has certain categories. It seems like over the years, it's getting tighter and tighter and harder and harder to turn over a profit. Where did we go wrong? Is it as an industry or is it just in general, just with the economy and things keep getting added to the list? Yeah, we went wrong. Um, where we went wrong, and I'm guilty of it, is we were cool hairstylists that rocked at doing hair. And we thought, I'm going to open a business, and I'm going to do it better than my owner, and I'm going to treat people better, and I'm going to pay people better. And then we took two to five people, um, you know, and started our business and offered them a higher pay. And then the next group did the same thing, and then the next group did the same thing. And now the, expe the expectation... Wow. I never thought of that. The expectation of what... Yeah. people could get got higher and then it became a standard and yep. now that it's a standard everybody is terrified to pay lower because they think that the people will leave to somewhere else that will pay them higher yeah and so and what i i'm telling you is the only, the reason people work for you is not only their paycheck and i had my staff come our, my staff were paid a lower commission than anybody around us but guess what their t4s were higher than anyone around us yeah. And so, and I had my staff come to me and say, Hey, I was at a hair show and so-and-so hit me up and offered me like 50, 50. And I said, okay, go back and ask them, um, ask the stylist in that salon, what's on their T4. Sure enough, they weren't bringing home 80 K on their T4. So, you know, they were bringing home 60 K at 60%, you know, numbers my girls were bringing lie. home 80 K at 40%. So yeah. it's not, we need to re-educate it's not about a percentage. It's about what, like, what are you taking home, right? And is that salon able to do marketing? Is the salon able to keep it beautiful so people are willing to pay a higher price point? Can they drive business to you? Like, these are all the things the salon can do only when they have some profit to play with, right? So, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I have a, I have a touchy question. Uh, I'm sure it's going to get touchy out there, but uh, Franco, <laughs> Franco's going to test this. Why is this not being taught in schools? In, in well, it's, like in terms of how to how to run yourself or a business or at least a little bit of the numbers. Why is this not being taught in the salon schools uh, in general? Well, the, it's not really the salon school's job to. Um, they're there to teach a technical skill. Are you talking about to the stylist? Okay, let's speak to. Yeah. Um, at, le should, at least to get yeah. an overview of what they need to look for, so that from day one they got a foundation and they know exactly what to look for. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's up to us to change and then the school can teach the new standards, right? But the school can't say, oh, um, you should only expect to get paid 40% and then they go out and get offered 50 or 60. Have you ever done the budget on how long it takes to, um, or how long and how expensive it is to take somebody out of school, train them, 
and get them profitable? What is your return on investment in each client or style? I think what Terenzi was saying is, is like, why are we not? And I totally agree with the question and, and I understand like, why is it that so many different industries, like let, let's for instance, look at the restaurant industry again. When yeah. you go as a chef, right? You go to school to be a chef and by the time you leave without even your red seal or anything, you're taught your budgeting of how to budget a meal, let's say. Okay. We have hairstylists that come out of hair school and they don't know how to budget on not only how much to charge because every salon is so different, but they don't even know how to charge their own service. Um, they yeah. don't know how to charge or how much they actually cost the salon. And I think that's what Terenzi was wondering is like, how do we encourage the, sal the salon, the schools to educate more of a business side of things and on, you know, like what's the most important thing at, for a stylist coming out of hair school, building a clientele. So many other industries, a student comes out of hair or out of a course, being able to make money for the business right away. For us, they don't make money until two, three years down the road. And then once they start making money, they demand more money because they're like, hey, they're entitled to uh, like this worth that they've just discovered when it was on the back of our business that in encouraged them to build that business. Yeah. So this is all just lack of knowing your numbers, right? Because yeah. um, you can take, so I have a cool sheet for that is to figure out, you know, how much the stylist burden is. Um, and so you can just reduce their hours until they're meeting that burden. So you're not losing money on them. So I would say like within three months, you should be able to be um, breaking even on, on them. Okay. Um, and I would say, I'm not sure if we need to start with the schools. I think we need to start with the owners <laughs> because, yeah. um, you know, the schools can teach one thing to the, the stylist and then they're going to come experience something else in the salon. So I think we need to start with the owners and the owners need to understand their businesses. The owners need to understand their business model. And then the schools can train that piece. I love that idea of like the, the they, they need to understand that piece, but they need to be able to go into a salon that can support them on that. Um, and so if the school is teaching them one thing and then they get into a salon and it's totally different, it's just not going to be that cohesive. I think the schools don't really know, like, how are they supposed to know what to teach? Because it's so there's no really standard, right? It's so varied. So I saw for the last 15 years, at, le at least 20 salons a day uh, on average. So I got to see a lot of what was going on. Why is it that a lot of salon owners do not look for training? Why do they not buy <laughs> services? Because I, I've even brought up the question. We've had we've had situations where we had some training that we were offering. We partnered up with some companies, and it it just wasn't there. What's your opinion on that? Oh, I wish I could answer that because I my, my business would boom. <laughs> um, but I think it's just <laughs> lack of awareness, right? It's lack of like when I started my company and I was working six days a week, and I thought that I was doing awesome. I didn't think I needed help. Right. So like maybe they just don't realize that they need help or it's not being presented to them in the right way. There's also like so many disconnects because there's, you know, a lot of times I'd run into Roe at West Coast and he'd tell me about a training and I'm like, what the heck? Like, I don't know about that training. How come I don't know about that? And maybe they like came in not with my part time receptionist and she didn't pass it on or maybe the email got lost or, you know, I think there's just a lot of disconnects happening everywhere um, that, yeah, we need to find a better way to deliver the product to the the consumer but and build the desire up like they need to have the desire and for them to need to have the desire they need to know that something's not working and if they just keep our business is a really cash flow business right like some businesses say um a construction company like you're gonna run out of cash because you're paying your employees baby before you got paid and then you're gonna know you have a problem and you're gonna need to know your numbers to bridge the gap between you know that money coming in but we're such a cash heavy business that people pay when they come. So we kind of always have cash going through. So they don't know until they get slammed with a tax bill yep. or an unexpected payroll bill. Like they don't realize that they're not doing well. And then and they the may ignore that tax bill right from that last year. And so maybe it's like three, four years before this ton of bricks is catching up to them and they're just having fun. So, you know, yeah. the government, <laughs> the government's getting very smart as to when it comes to looking at numbers, they've, they've got averages, they, they can click a button now and find out what's going on. And it really sucks because there's a lot of talented stylists out there that think that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And at the end of the, at the end of the, the year, like you said, they're stuck with this hefty bill 
and and just that fear factor. I don't know what it is about the tax people, but when they come, and just thinking about them, you you just you always wonder if they're gonna come and find something. Okay, when I go yeah. over the border, I feel like I'm always <laughs> carrying something over. I'm like, okay, did we check everything? Like, you know, like worried, like like you just and I have the nexus, and we're still like that. We're like, okay. I know you still feel like, like, oh, I'm I'm innocent. I swear. Um, uh, well, this is also a funny thing in our industry is you know I I teach classes and. In the class, they're like, well, what if I don't declare my cash? And I'm like, in what other world would you put your hand up in a public place and say, I'm frauding the government? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, when, like, when is this acceptable, right? And they don't understand that they're shooting themselves in the foot because right now, you know, if you haven't been declaring all of your money and now you're looking for government support, well, it's maybe not gonna be there for you. Um, you know, if you, we, with my salon, um, we were able to purchase a, a property for ourselves, a residential property, because we claimed all the income and that income allowed us to have a mortgage we wouldn't have been able to have had we been hiding the cash sales or, you know, yeah. hiding it under. And with that house, that grew and we were able to get a rental property. And with that, that grew and, you know, it's like well, domino I think, effect. I think that's where the whole, like, um, where a lot of stylists make mistakes by saying, no, I don't want my tax or my tips on my paychecks. Um, and it's like, you, they don't want it on their paycheck because they don't want to claim their tips. But then it's like, yeah, but at the year end, you're making more money. And then at the when you do get to the point that you want to invest, you're going to be able to get more because you're showing more money that you're earning and you're saving more because we all, we're all in the same boat. Cash is spent much easier than something that is just going straight into your savings. And, you know, the banks have so many different systems set up that, you know, your check, you can put a percentage of your check going into one account and another percentage of your checks going into another and investments. They can't do that with your, t your tips. No. And, and hairstylists aren't, we are not responsible enough to think of the future in that way because, like you said, we're such cash heavy that we're in the moment of what we have right now, not thinking what can we have later by, you know, taking a little bit less to invest a little bit more. Yeah. And it, it's it's sad to see. And I think, you know, on my side, being a chair rental salon and, a, and in the and industry of chair rentals, I really see that happening with a lot of chair renters is, you know, they have the most profitability being a chair renter, but yet they still have no savings and they still don't have money for the raining days. And I constantly have the, the, the conversation with them. It's it's not how much you're earning, it's how much you're spending. You know, your, your bottles of wine every night, every day, because you're celebrating with your tips. That's not gonna help you save for the future for the pandemics like this um, and, and, and transition and, and be ready for it. Or even, you know, we live in one of the most expensive cities in the world and everyone complains about rent, but it's like, well, you know, yeah, it sucks and we're all in the same boat, but you're still earning quite a bit of money. It's just you're not saving and, and keeping that cash where it belongs. You're just spending it before you actually even earned it. My dad always said, it's never how much you make, it's how much you save. If you're spending a thousand and you're making 500, you, you, you know, did he, like. Uh, did he give you a cuff in the, in the head too? Like my dad? <laughs> no, one of these, the chapelle. <laughs> well, he was a white man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my yeah, dad had part of me. And I think that's the bigger question is why don't, don't we teach this in school, real school, right? Like it's just financial literacy. And it's, um, you know, I was lucky enough to take an interest in it when I was like 16. I, I read The Wealthy Barber because it kind of tied in with our industry. Um, and that's what got me interested in money and finance. And my parents didn't have money. They still don't. And I think like, thankfully, all these books were written and somehow I got interested in them. And years and years of reading all of this stuff is what got me to where I am today. Um, and so they're just law. They're, they're like, laws of life and if you know them they work for you um and if you don't they're working against you they're still there right there's compounding interest it's either compounding for you or it's compounding against you um so it's not like the laws and the rules don't go away um it's just whether they're working for you or against you and so thankfully your dad taught them you know how to use them to work for you um not everyone's so fortunate and i wish that was totally. taught in school um and that's what i'm here you know that's why i'm here is to teach people and try to make it fun, right? As fun as numbers can be, like let's try to lighten it up and make it I fun. I think cause... you've done a pretty damn good job making <laughs> it fun for numbers. Cause you know, like it's it's not fun. I, I hate, you know, I have to be honest. The, the first day of that class was like one of the most depressing times of my career as a business owner. Like it was a 
I said a an punch in the face, but no, it was more than an eye opener, man. It was like, you know, a grasp on the things that you just don't want to grasp on. And it was, it was something that, you know, it was shocking, but having that reality and, but the way we make it, you know, fun out of it. And, and it's like, we're all in the same boat. And, and I think that's where I'm most frustrated about, you know, our industry is that even though we're all the same, we're all in the same boat, we still compete against each other and try to prove that we do it better and, and I do it this way because, and because of that, how, like when we did the recent uh, talk, um, Kaylee uh, in Langley at the, the beauty, beauty council. Yeah, you know, we had, you had so many different models of businesses um, to teach about and it's like, how is that fair to not only you or the stylist or the students or the business owners to have that difficulty of deciding which model to go to um, when the percentage of profitability in all models is still the same, you mm -hmm. know, or, or still such a struggle to get to an actual profit. Um, and, and, and it's just, it's, yeah, it's just frustrating because, you know, we're such passionate people. We give everything we do. It's grueling on our body. It's grueling on our mind. Um, your chat on your salon network, you know, um, I think it was Tina. She said it is people don't actually respect how much we take home in, our, in, a, in a mental status and physical. You know, it, it took me to open up a salon for people to stop being like, oh, you know, what are you going to do after this? Like, you know, it's a hobby. And and once I took on a huge lease and a huge debt, people started being like, oh, you're serious about this, hey? And it's like, <laughs> the like, are you kidding me right now? Like, you didn't see me struggle all these years trying to build my clientele, asking you to refer me clients. Like, you know, and and I think that's where, like, it's, it's, it's the struggle. And it's so sad to see how many people go to hair school and don't do hair after. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, what is it, like 10%? Of, yeah. of students or less. Come out and or less like I remember I had a 40 I think it was 40 students when I started they broke off two stu uh, two different classes of 20 and 20 and out of all the 40 combined I think there's only like five or three of us that are actually hairdressers and I think I'm one of the only ones that actually op opened up a salon and is running a salon still and it's mm -hmm. shocking because uh, it's like they were so talented but there's something that really doesn't connect and and I really you know, I, I love that we're able to have these conversations now that we have the downtime um, and, and the ability to to engage with each other. I have a question for you, Kaylee. You said that, you know, you picked up the book, um, The Wealthy Barber. And I have a question. Would you have picked that? Do you think you would have picked that same book up if you weren't in the hairdressing game? No. Not right? No. So, so that's thank where, you. Like, you, you, were, you said you were lucky. Um, but that's fortunate because we are all fortunate to be in this industry because we've worked so hard to make this work for us because it's not a, an industry that is given to you. Um, it's not an industry that is easy to build a clientele. Um, it, there's so many factors in this industry that affect why the client comes back or doesn't come back. Um, why stylists stay, why stylists don't, why business owners stay open and why business owners have to close or are forced to close. Um, and it's just, it's, it's crazy because we, we, we look at it as something that we're lucky for, but we're very fortunate to, to have each other in this time in need and outside of these times in needs. And I know I was very fortunate to meet you. Um, and, and, and I hope that, you know, doing these things will, will just grow our community and, and strengthen our community. Yeah. I have to say, because you, Franco, you're a salon owner. Technically, yes. you could be choosing the competitive route right now. You could be keeping this all for yourself. But here you are, you're wanting to share uh, amongst all the other hairdressers and salon owners out there so that you can help, you know, be that positive change. So I give you kudos. I give you a lot of credit for that. That's well, amazing. there's a reason for that. It's because of the like, I do feel fortunate because my whole life I struggled with education, with academics. You know, I grew up in a household like like you did, Terenzio is, you know, first generation. My dad worked in a mill. You know, <laughs> hard work pays off. If you don't work hard, he's going to kick you in the ass. Um, and like my dad was like, you know, I provide what you need. Whatever you want, you have to work for. And yeah. at 16, I had a job. My first spring break, I had to work full time and I was pissed off at 16 and, and I resented my dad so long. Um, but it, it gave me the perspective and it gave me the appreciation now. And I, I feel like because I grew up in such a loving family and such a supportive family, for me to go and open up a salon and not be so genuine and not be so candid and, and transparent, I wouldn't be living up to what my parents taught me. 
like mm-hmm. that that fortune not too many people have that fortune you know like i when i opened up my salon and i i started bringing in chair renters of all different types and all different specialties and stuff it really opened my eyes that a lot of people have different stories and a lot of people have different pasts but yet we're all in the same present and mm-hmm. we're all trying to make a better future but if we're not talking about the past and not trying to better the present to make a better future we're all just going to be continuously running in that in that hamster wheel um, so, you know, sometimes the hamster keeps running and then something shocks it to come out of that wheel. And, and for me, I, I want to provide a space of comfort and support. Uh, and, you know, Gary V is, is somebody that I watch a lot, um, Gary Vanderchuk on YouTube, and he is all about just giving it away. And, and yeah. I respect the man for that because he could contain it all in and, and make people pay for it. But yet he gives it away because his passion is to see somebody say, hey, man, thank you so much for that help. And that's kind of like my approach with chair rental is like, I really appreciated myself being a chair renter. So I saw that there was some good. Um, and did you have someone, a mentor, Franco, when you were getting started? Or did you have a, to learn it as a chair renter or as a stylist to learn the business side? Did you have someone or did you have to learn it on your own? So on a business side, I had to learn it somewhat on my own. Um, as a young stylist, I went to, I started in Yale Town, and Yale Town is a very difficult market to build a clientele. Um, I started there six months at a hairdressing school and I, I had to sit and watch a lot um, because there was no clients walking in. There was 15 salons within a two block radius and my prices were quite high because my, my the salon owner, Charlene, she said, like, you're worth it. So just believe in it and you'll, you'll get there. So I didn't believe that I was worth it at that time. So I had to force myself um, to really look at myself and see why I'm worth it. And actually, one of my brothers were a big part of my mentorship because I, got, I looked to them and they would ask me the questions like, okay, well, what makes you different than the people beside you? Why should somebody come to you? Um, mm-hmm. So, and, and I had a, a few stylist mentors like David Martino. He was my biggest mentor as a stylist. Um, and I kind of did the whole, like, you know what? I have to stop you there. I didn't know that, uh, he was your mentor, but when I was 15, I was passing him his perm papers. <laughs> really? My, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. That's so oh, yeah, funny. Yeah. That's where I skipped high school and went there. I was standing there oh, and, and I was like, oh, he's that like. pink climb or was that a. No, set? that was back in uh, Metrotown. <laughs> that's the one in spa. Oh, shoot. Every that's... time I see that guy, I feel like I got to have a cigarette. You know, he's just got that look to him. You know? He does. And I know, he, I think when... cause he was like, I was just in awe of him. And um, yeah, me too. The yeah. way he does things and the way he manipulates hair and his, like everything about the way he does things, it's intoxicating. Yeah. It's, so that's it, funny. We had one of the same uh, same mentors there. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, Franco, that's one of the things that I always um, respected in you too is that giving side, the generous side, and you're always looking at like how can we collaborate, how can we like lift people up, bring them on board. And um, one kind of analogy I always like to use is like when people say, "Is your glass half empty or half full?" Um, I'm like, my freaking glass is overflowing. <laughs> like so it's not some. like half of anything, right? And I think that's where, um, you know, people, there's like this fine line between hairstylists that are generous, but they're actually like giving the last drop in their own glass. And so there's like a fine line where you're full and overflowing um, to you're just giving everything and you're empty. And I think that's an uh, important um, distinction where like generosity comes out of like overflowing. Um, and so, and that's, you know, what I've seen in you, like, you know, evolving and growing your business and everything. You're at that point where you can overflow onto others and it's really cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. He's, he's got that side of him, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. But I also see a lot of people that are just giving, 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 and they're running dry, right? And it's, it, you know, when you yeah. go on the airplane, um, they, what do they tell you? Put your mask on first. First, yeah. And so some, you know, some of the listeners here may need to do that first and then work on the, the generosity side. They kind of go in hand in hand together, right? Um, so, you know, you can always do something for the community. It's going to boost you up. That's going to fill you up at the same time and work on filling that glass so it can be be overflowing. Well, and I feel like right now for hairstylists, like specifically new hairstylists and experienced hairstylists is, you know, a sustainable clientele is something that we we must start thinking of because it does the business doesn't work if we're not all contributing. Um, you know, Terenzio, we talked about this last time is like, you know, in the end, both sides of the business want to get there. And if you're both not contributing, you're not going to get there. And, you know, yeah, you got to put your mask on first, but you also need to know what to do 
to get there, like to get that mask on, right? Like, I feel like sometimes hairdressers come into it being like, okay, I got to do what I got to do and I'll support the salon. And then once they get to that point, they're like, okay, I am me. And I'm saying this out of like my experience, like I, I did it. Um, I started looking at my paycheck and I was like, well, I'm earning this, I'm earning this, I'm earning this. But I didn't realize that I wasn't bringing enough in to earn it. I was just doing the overflow until I left. And then I realized, oh, I need to start bringing in my own sustain, like my sustainable clientele. Yeah. Um, so I, I really focus on my client or my stylist being like, okay, what are you bringing into the business? Because that is the sustainability of the business that you're providing. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and and it is true. Like, I love that analogy. Like, put your mask on first, but yet, you know, still think of others um, once you're established, because there, there is plenty of room for sharing. You're not like putting the mask on all day long. Right. It's like you put the no. mask on and then you hop everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's a two second thing. But yeah, everyone's it's like this. Like, it's not like <laughs> me, 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 me. I got my mask. <laughs> yeah. Totally. No, it's like put your mask on and then get to work. Right. And we that's exactly like in salons. We need to start working as a team. Like we are on the same team. If like Franco, you decide to do a promo, it's because you think it's going to grow your business. And right. And then everyone's freaking out like, well, I'm losing money because it's a discount or a promo or whatever. And it's like, if, if the salon owner is doing something to make you lose money, they're losing it times 10. Yeah. So yep. they would never do that. So if they're doing the promo, it's because they know maybe you're going to take a dip this month and next month it's going to come back like, you know, I remember this in my salon, we did a buy two, get one uh, free and we couldn't give commission with that promo because it would just be a loss then. Um, and you know, there was just so much backlash from it. And so that's where like the owner needs to be educated because now they need to educate their people and show them the numbers, right? Like this is what we're giving back to the client. And, and when you have your data too, we, we looked back and said, how many products do you normally sell to your client? And they were average like one, 1. 1.5. And I'm like, now your client's buying three and they risk to rebuy those three. So now you've doubled your retail sales um, and maybe you'll not have commission this one month, right? And yeah. so we, if the owner doesn't understand how it works, they can't educate the people and everybody starts doing this commission tug of war thing. There are some great salon owners out there and there was one time, I'm not gonna name the salon, she started her own company, her own salon, worked her way up, built the careers of these amazing stylists, did everything by the book in, in terms of you know financial uh, commissions, um, spending a lot of money to send them away to educate them. And there's a salon owner down the block who scopes out these stylists and somehow connected with them and offered them like 20% more or something like that. And Let's literally stole these stylists away from this hardworking salon owner who I, I also respected very much. And when I saw that, it was... That's the thing about this industry. It's even if you, that, I wish there was a way to police it, but I guess that there really isn't. There is a way, it's communication. Um, I don't feel like our, the salon owners communicate enough. Uh, I've talked to a lot of salon owners that don't even do reference checks anymore. Um, yeah. Because I, I don't even do it. I, I don't reference check anymore because the references that they give are their references that they know are gonna give them good results. So mm-hmm. what, like, if you're not allowed, I, I mm-hmm. believe this is right, illegally you're not allowed to ask or go and reach out into the community that they don't offer references so it's like you're only allowed to ask references that they're providing you yeah Um, but you can you can specifically ask for like your last employer's reference say stylists are coming and applying to you that are still in a salon that they want to leave the salon it's very difficult for you to ask that salon hey i have your stylist here and they're looking to move your from your salon yeah but yeah but that's where you know I, i would be checking up on that and there's been you know, would you rather be um, the Medina Cafe, right? I don't know if we're speaking only to Vancouver rights, but the Medina Cafe that has the lineup out the door or, um, you know, the big business that can accommodate everyone. And sometimes you just keep, I know people are just hiring without doing their due diligence because they're like, oh, you're breathing, you have a pulse, like I need people. Um, But why not work with your team that's working and keep raising your prices and become more that Medina Cafe with the demand out the door. And yes, you need a screening process. We did a three-step interview. Um, with reference checks and just the process, like half of them drop off before the third interview, right? So just putting them through like every time, Franco, that I hired somebody outside of my process, it bit me in the butt and you can ask. And even like my manager, we'd sit there and be like, oh, they're so nice. Oh my gosh, they're so nice. We don't need to bother with that last interview. They're perfect. Oh my gosh, like, why did we do that? And then we'd say, we're never doing that again. We're sticking to our process. And then the next time, oh, we don't really need to do the personality like test, whatever. 
Um, and yeah, and then, oh my gosh, what, or, no, 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 you know what we did? We did a personality test, um, like these, you know, those little quizzes to say. Color, yeah. Strengths, yeah. yeah. Um, we did it and it said that she was um, really aggressive and blunt and we're like, no, she's so sweet. She must have answered the question wrong. This cannot be right. I kid you not, like two months later, she was like aggressing the team, like no tomorrow. Her true colors were coming out and we were like, why didn't we listen to our process? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have to have a systemized way of doing things. And like, I am I started out as an artist hairdresser too. Like I rejected systems. When I graduated from hairdressing school, they made us wear like pantyhose under, like if we had, um, we were in the Okanagan. And mm -hmm. if you wore sandals, you had to wear like old lady pantyhose under them. I don't, cause they didn't want you to get like hair in your nails or something. And I like, I like rejected it so bad because I'm like, I am not wearing those ugly things. It's hot out. And so the last day they told me if you don't come to school with like a pant with panty, I think she said it like singularly somehow, um, then you're not graduating. And so I went there with one on. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, there you go. I don't <laughs> like your system, right? So I was like the bratty stylist, like anyone else, um, rejecting systems until I realized in a salon how they support you. And they actually support you to be creative. They support you against yourself and your own emotions. Um, and so having like a hiring process can protect you from making the wrong hire, even if it's just that one person you're putting through and maybe they're the wrong person and you stick with the team you have, right? Because yeah. the wrong hire, it just costs you so much money um, and time. Is there, is there a way to, so there's a lot of stylists, whether they're just starting from school now or whether they already have been uh, working behind the chair, is there any way to give them insight so that they, moving forward, that they can do something about their business? Yeah, it has to be relative to them, right? Like all of a sudden my business is so much more relative to all the salon owners because they're like, crap, I don't know how we're gonna recover financially from this. We need yeah. to have a plan. Um, and so while I've been here for the past few years saying, hey, take my course, do this, you know, it wasn't as relative as it is now. And so as the owner, you need to find a way to make it relative to your people to care about it. And that comes in more of a form of like, how much money do you wanna take home this, this year? Let's break that down. And now we need to break it down. What does that mean per month? What does that mean per week, per day, per hour? And now we need to say, oh, well, you're currently only bringing in, um, you know, enough to take home 20 bucks an hour. This is what you need to do to take home 50. And when they can see that, now they're more interested in selling the treatment or selling the retail or, so we need to like make it relevant to them to where they are. We need to meet them where they are. We can't expect them to like, they're not thinking the way I'm thinking after all of the experience that I had as an owner, right? They're not thinking that way. So we need to meet, we need to go back to ourselves in that time and be like, what did I need to hear? Have you ever had anybody who didn't make financial gain and everybody who you've worked with? No, they all they've do. Always, they've always yeah. made it. Okay. You either are coaching the person up or you're coaching them out, right? So, yeah, and I get it, it. I like again, that. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not like a yeah. mean, bad thing. We're coaching you up or we're yeah. coaching you out. And so now the person, um, I, I have had people, you know, the timing was awful. The timing was just awful that like you could never risk having a good paycheck because you're taking like five hours to do a color. I couldn't stand yeah. it. I was like walking by her like, like I just want to freak out, right? I'm like, what the, <laughs> why is that taking so long? Like move over, I'm going to do it for you. And so I just coached her every single day and I put so much pressure on her um, that she ended up leaving. And, yeah. you know, she went to a salon where timing wasn't such a big issue and it wasn't, you know, that was, but that wasn't the vibe we had. We were like, uh, we were, um, we knew our client, our market and our market was corporate women was our like main focus. And so we knew corporate women couldn't come in and sit for four hours. So, um, so she, you know, she moved, she was super happy somewhere else. Um, but if I wouldn't have like stayed on her, I could have been annoyed for 10 years every time I walked by her. Right. And, um, so it's, that's the leader's job to coach your team up to what your expectations are. And if not, usually they self-select out because you're putting yeah. the pressure on them. So they either rise to the challenge or they self-select out. In extreme cases, you may have to free up their future. Um, but most Which cases- Which is fair. Yeah, you have to yeah. be honest, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and I always just try to look at things in the positive light. And that yeah. is, if it's not working for me, it's probably not working for you either. Right. Yep, and so yeah. like, how long are we both going to be in agony for? <laughs> and well, once I, you know, once I let a girl go um, who was super cool and awesome, but she didn't fit her culture. And when I let her go, she was shocked. And then she thanked me because she's like, I knew I didn't fit here either, but I probably would have stayed for years before I made the change. 
hypothetically speaking, if, if we were to quickly role play here, let's say I come to you, what would it look like if you were to so walk me through it? We would do a consultation and then I would prepare a proposal for you. And in the proposal, I would give you three different ways that we could work together. Um, obviously like an entry way and then a level where I'm like highly involved in your business. Um, and then we would enter into a contract together and the contracts are six months to a year um, because it doesn't serve you or me to have like five talks, right? Like it just, we're not, you're not going to get the results and it's not a good investment of my time. Um, the, the lowest way someone can work with me is to take my online program and then they are part of the group calls. Um, so that's the lowest investment. And that's really cool too, because all that stuff I would want them to do anyway. Um, if I was right. to coach them so yeah. they can do that instead of me delivering that information and them paying me one-on-one -on -one to deliver it, they can do a self-study. It's way more accessible for them. And then when we do coach one-on-one, -on -one, we can dive right in. Yeah. Um, but what, yeah, we have to start with a financial review because, um, the advice I'm going to, so I'll give you an example. One of my friends, she's in the U S she called me and she's like, I'm going to change to your pay scale. Um, she does strategies like team-based pay. And, you know, we talked about that at the class, Franco, like all the different models. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And she's like, how do I do it? What do I do? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I can't tell you what to do when I don't understand your whole business model and what you're doing right now. And she's like, I'm, my payroll's too high. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We got to take like back the trade up, <laughs> send me all your numbers. I looked at all her numbers. She didn't have a payroll problem. Her payroll is at 40% sitting there nicely. She had a support staff problem. And so imagine I said, yeah, yeah, you should go to this commission model. She disrupts her whole culture. She upsets people because she's changing the way she pays. And it does zero to budge the line on her profit. Zero. Oh, if anything, yeah. she may lose people and lose money. So we were looking, we were like, think of it as like you're bleeding right and you may be like hemorrhaging from the head you've got lots of little cuts and franco you said it earlier where you know trying to like negotiate nickel on and that. Dime. nickel and dime so like okay you're like fixing these cuts while you're hemorrhaging out of your head right like yeah we want to heal the the cuts but let's take care of the hemorrhage first yeah. and so the hemorrhage could be and we never finished that like um the hemorrhage could be the color loss down the tube it could be the support staff it could be the payroll and so we need to see what's happening there before i can make any recommendation and so like anyone who just calls me off the cuff like I, it's like if your client comes in and they're like give me a makeover and you know zero about them I just want to ask you one thing that you just talked about is colorways. You know, after we talked with the class that I took with you, that was that changed my perspective of, of what I was doing with my color tracking. And I, I, I introduced this system that it, it is working, but it's really, really difficult to educate the new stylists that are coming in on the way I do it. And I created a spreadsheet that goes gram to gram. So every time they, they stylists have their phones in their hands, 98% of the day, other than when their scissors and, and combs are in their hands or their, their color brushes. So I said that I, what I've done is, every color that you use, you send in the grams to my front desk. She puts it in their spreadsheet. She, we find out the number, and then that way we have a total number of costs at the end of the month, and it's been working amazing. The difficulty is, is that commission stylists constantly think that they're paying for color because they see the cost of the color. And it's it's such a big struggle for me because I, I'm always having to, like in my interviews, I explain it to them. I have a breakdown on their contract, but yet it's a constant battle to come to that point of educating them. Um, mm -hmm. And I love the way you explained it to me. It's like going to the mechanic. When you go to the mechanic, you have parts and labor, but yet the stylists still just want to think that they actually are paying for this. And it, it, it's, it's one of those things that I'm just like, how do we get past that? Like, yeah, I, I know a lot of salons that are like, oh, that's why I don't even deal with it. I just charge them extra percentage on their on their yeah. commissions and I don't track it. But then I'm like, but now you're costing 20 percent of your loss. Like you're probably losing so much and you have okay. support staff. So there's a new company out called Salon Scale. Um, yes, and you don't necessarily have to do Salon Scale. But um, this is the concept is it's the parts and service model. We need to teach the stylist how to bill for their time. And then they need to add the product on and the product needs to ring under the house. So no more of this 10% charge. It's too confusing and we're charging the wrong people, the wrong things. So if we have a 10% charge off the top and we have a color correction and we have a bleach out and that bleach out is like literally four bucks and the color correction is like 50 bucks. Now that bleach out's paying the color corrections color bill. 
Right. And so it's just not ethical pricing. And the um, and it's not that like any stylist watching this, it's not because your owner is a bad person. Like they just don't know any other way to do it. Um, and so, you know, they've put in the product fee, which we did too. We had a product, we had a back end product fee. And we tried our best to make it the, the right price, but you just don't know because yeah. it's so varying, right? And so um, it, until Salon Scale came along where you actually have a digital Bluetooth scale and you weigh the color and the color's already entered in with the price and it goes into their phone with how much color that person's used, um, now you have a real number to charge. And then you add that onto your hourly rate. And now there's no confusion about I'm paying for that color because the, the client is paying for the color on their bill. The cool thing that they're doing right now is they're not charging. So you can start right now to oh, get all of your stuff set up. Okay. It is a chart. Yeah. But do, during COVID, they're not charging. Ah. Um, and then they're also offering a free month. So, okay. you know, you can get on it and get used to it before and see. And then you can check if you know your numbers well, you can check to see that you're earning a lot more than what you're paying. Um, but yeah, you would factor that in. Definitely. You could factor that in. So they do teach to put a margin on your color, right? When you put it in there. Um, so, but everybody I've seen on it has increased because the like stylists just have, you know, they're, they're starting to be more careful with the color they use too, because they're seeing their client's bill rack up to 50, 60 bucks. And they're like, Ooh, I'm going to have to lower my <laughs> rate so now this. because I already quoted them. Um, so they're being way more, that's really helping with wastage too. So they're being way more careful and you can do the same concept without salon scale yeah. is you can just, you know, they charge their hour and then the supplies, but now they're guessing at the price, which gets a bit sketchy. Um, so then you have to do a really good education on like, you know, what you have to have a really easy checklist so that they can find out what they're charging per bowl or, you know, but yeah. you're leaving a bit more gray area in there. So I really like the salon scale. I like it when things are black and white and clean and specific and especially and that. in an industry that we're always in the gray. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is a new way of charging and it's like really ethical pricing because the right person is paying for their own product. We're not just taking a guesstimate. Um, it's nowhere near touching the, the staff. So they know exactly what commission to expect because they're billing just for their hours. Um, so I really like it. I think it's the best solution to this ongoing. We've been talking about this for years, right? Like yeah. smoke and mirrors, like this percentage, that percentage, whatever way you slice it, like the salon's got to pay for color. So well, I think this way like with the color and then even the support staff, it's like those two things are the most like expensive things that we just have. We have so much control over it, but yet we have no control over it because people don't respect that usage and, and especially the support staff. The support staff is like, I believe that if you're using the support staff, you should be paying for it. Just as the restaurants do, like, you know, you have a setter, you have a hostess, you have your, you know, everybody contributes out of their to gross sales Everybody throws in their tips, a percentage of their gross sales into a bin. Everybody that's a support staff that doesn't technically make tips gets tipped out and that becomes a part of their payment structure. Yeah. Like, I so really this, love that. Yeah, this gets a bit messy because um, that's where your employees can say they're paying for costs, right? And that's against yeah. the law. That's against the labels. So in theory, it's nice, but- Well, um, tip out, um, out of their tip you out. Could, you yeah, can? you could do a tip out, but now the tips are- um, Tracked are the business responsibilities and it changes everything. Um, so it just gets a bit shady again, like gray, but yeah, it's, I can't remember exactly. Um, but it does put a higher burden on the business when you start to control, those are called control tips, um, ah, okay. instead of direct tips and it changes the category that they go under. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's just a lot of like, we just want to keep it clean, but there are ways to go around it. Like our top stylist, um, we offered bonuses. So we just, instead of a bonus, they got an apprentice. Um, so, you know, there's always like creative ways to structure it that are not against the law. Um, but we do have to be careful because there's a lot of laws out there that, and it's not know, very clear. Like the law sometimes isn't so clear too. Like it, you, you got to read it like a hundred times and you got to get somebody else to read it for you. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. There, you got to yeah, stay you open the gray. Yeah. You can always call the labor standard, but at the end of the day, if you get audited, the person's reading by the book and they don't yeah. care what your backstory is. So you better yeah. just keep it, keep it all about Bart and keep it really clean. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we went, we covered a lot of different. Yeah. <laughs> we've been all around. I love it. I hope people will comment and, and let us know if we want to have a more of this conversation. How can people find you? Well, my Facebook is Kaylee Auge, C-A-Y-L-E-E-A-U-G-E. And you can find me on Instagram. Email is success at Kaylee Auge. So I'll, I'll put it in the links. But yeah. um, I've got a free webinar on Mondays right now um, talking about a little bit deeper about the cash flow plan. 
Um, so they can join me on my free webinar. It's at 1130 on Mondays. It's evolving every week, right? We're yeah. adding in, we're finding out, you know, what are people's needs and um, trying to speak to those. Um, so yeah, reach out and uh, let us know what your needs are and we can maybe speak to that. Um, or maybe we already have some resources that I probably have a spreadsheet for it <laughs> that I can send you. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Kaylee O'Shea from Love Your Business. Yeah. It was such a pleasure yes. to have you on. We absolutely love your energy and we hope to have you again. Thank you guys. I love your initiative. I love um, these types of conversations. They're really fun. So I'll look forward to the next time. If anybody has any questions on anything that we talked about, put them in the comments below and we will make sure to respond and answer some more questions. Soon.